Uh, well, the approval of the FDA uh, of this new sapien valve is very important because it's really the only way in which uh, very sick patients with aortic valve disease who have a lot of other problems and would not tolerate surgery, it's the only way they could have a valve replacement without an operation. So it's a tremendous breakthrough and it will help a large number of people with, with aortic valve disease. Well, here at OHSU we have uh, at least a dozen patients that are on a waiting list ready for, ready for the surgery. And around the country it would be an enormous amount because about 30 or 40 percent of patients with aortic stenosis or aortic valve disease are not amenable, are not, are not uh, uh, well enough to undergo an operation. The risk of surgery is too high. And so in the past they've not been treated appropriately. And now we have a way of doing it. Well, they will die of congestive heart failure, and, uh, and also the, uh, during the course of that death, their care will be very expensive. So while the valve itself is quite expensive, it's probably very cost effective in terms of getting the patient out of the hospital, up and around, feeling pretty good, without a lot of additional high cost medical care. Well, it's hard to know because the uh, uh, new sites uh, are in the process of being approved and uh, I'm sure that OHSU will be one of those new sites and uh, they'll be spread out around the country. Uh, so we'll have to find that out. It was not clear from the FDA report how many sites would be allowed. Well, what's coming next uh, is a, a series of uh, new methods of treating structural heart disease, that is valve problems or problems with the cardiac muscle. Uh, uh, and the, so the next one would be, say, uh, dealing with the mitral valve and replacing the mitral valve through the apex of the heart or using a catheter-based system instead of surgery. And uh, we now can do that in experimental animals and, and it's not yet been approved for man, but it's on the way. Uh, another uh, uh, treatment would be clipping the two mitral leaflets together using a catheter-based technology in the heart without surgery to minimize the amount of leak through, in a, through a mitral valve in, in, in some patients. And, uh, and finally, there are ways of remodeling the, the main pumping chamber. If it gets too dilated, it can't contract well. And then by remodeling it and reshaping it, so it, it, it changes fr from a basketball shape to a football shape, which is a normal shape, then it can function much better in that, in that normal shape. And so reshaping the ventricle will also be a very important intervention. Well, um, uh, thus far there have been about 40,000 implants in 43 different countries. The United States has just got the nod today. So uh, uh, of these 40,000 patients, we've learned a lot. Uh, I'm sorry, of these, of these 4,000 patients, we've learned a lot. And um, the, there are some complications associated with it, like there would be for any kind of surgery or intervention. And one is the possibility of stroke, and that's maybe about a 4% possibility. Uh, the other is injury to the arteries on the way in with the catheter, because we go in through the femoral artery in the thigh, and if the artery is diseased or too small, you can actually injure that artery and it, would, it involves bleeding and then surgical repair of that vessel. But I, I think of all the complications, the major one is the potential for stroke, which is slightly higher than the standard aortic valve replacement. So the standard aortic valve replacement has a stroke rate of less than 2%. Uh, this device, the Sapien device, has a stroke rate of about 4%. This is the only one that could be put in without surgery. And also, we remember that these, these valves in Europe have been put in in elderly patients who have, normally have a high stroke rate. So it may not even be due to the valve. It's just an association. But there's been a lot of record keeping, and so we know of the, all the safety issues and all the potential complications uh, have all been carefully documented, uh, and the FDA has reviewed all of that before uh, granting this device acceptance. So a typical patient that would qualify for this, it would be uh, an elderly patient, let's say 70 years and older, who uh, had uh, 
serious aortic valve calcification and narrowing of the opening and needed an aortic valve replacement, but uh, they're very fragile, the patient is fragile or has other diseases, kidney disease, uh, liver disease, um, uh, uh, other uh, severe orthopedic problems where they can't move around very easily. In other words, all the things that would be a high risk for operation, so high that we would be reluctant to operate on them because the benefit doesn't outweigh the risks. Those patients would lend themselves really well to this new technology. So leading up to this, they would have an assist device? Is that what they're using currently? And because they don't qualify for surgery, how are, uh -huh. how are you treating their well, they're, they're, Right now they're treated medically. They're, they're treated with uh, drugs to enhance cardiac contraction uh, and, uh, and, and drugs to treat congestive heart failure, so to keep their, their lungs from getting filled with fluid, they might be on diuretics. They would have palliative uh, pharma pharmacological treatment rather than something aimed directly at the valve. Now, it is possible to dilate the valve with a balloon, and we've done a lot of those here at OHSU for this condition. But then what happens is, uh, after time, the, the narrowing of the valve recurs. The leaflets are just pushed apart and they back, come back together again. So this, in the process of implanting one of these devices, we dilate the valve open and then put the device in which keeps it from getting narrow again. Yes, what, what, what the study shows is the, not only is the longevity improved according to controlled patients, because these were a lot of control studies have been done. So the mortality rate is greatly decreased uh, in the first year after implantation, and the quality of life is greatly improved. And then if you do a cost-effectiveness study, that is, figure out what it, what it costs to put the valve in and take care of the patient afterwards, and what it costs to take care of the patient without putting the valve in, it's actually much more costly if you don't use the valve. Well, I think, I think OHSU is in a good position uh, and it's a good site uh, for using this device because, number one, we have a long-term relationship with the Edwards Life Sciences, the company that makes the valve, and they're the ones that worked with me in developing the first successful artificial mechanical valve. So we have a great relationship with the company. And, uh, and also we have great facilities for implantation. We have uh, beautifully uh, outfitted catheterization laboratories. We have a very uh, skilled interventional cardiologist, that is a cardiologist who are already used to putting things inside the heart and are very skilled at it. We have uh, marvelous uh, methods of visualizing the heart in, in uh, we're one of the number one uh, uh, units in the country for contrast visualization of the heart. And, and so putting all those assets together, uh, we're a great site for, uh, for deploying this device. Uh, there's, a, there's another element too uh, that, that makes us very suitable for it, and that is that because uh, OHSU has such a great reach to other communities around the state that uh, when we get approval for this device, which could come shortly, uh, we'd be able to provide this kind of technology not just to patients in the metropolitan area, but throughout the entire referral base for OHSU, which is statewide.